We are known as CFPL-TV in London, Ontario. This is the city we serve. CFPL-TV well, we was only the second private station to go on the air the in Canada. It was the vision Canada. of Walter Blackburn, the first the Canadian to own newspaper, radio region. and television London interests. But not even Blackburn region. could predict the impact of his modest little station. The Here arrival the of CFPL right single-handedly turned London Peter into a community of television viewers. I guess the highway was right after all the ceremony. I found out there was a fire at the Dutch Laundry. And off went our news people, did the first news shot, took it back to the studio, developed it, and had it on the 11 o'clock news. That was a great evening. Within 10 years, the demand for new television programming would be bottomless. The crude cable systems of 1952 would mushroom into a major Canadian industry. Ed Jarmain, who entered the fledgling business as a hobby, sold his lucrative dry cleaning business and made cable his full-time job. Without cable, you would probably be able to get passable reception. You wouldn't tolerate it today, but passable reception, uh, maybe 30 or 40 percent of the time. Well, now, of course, you know, if you want to sit down for an evening of television, now that's not exactly very satisfying. Television and cable changed the way London and eventually the rest of Canada were entertained. Families no longer had to go outside of their living rooms for an evening's entertainment. Professional touring companies stopped coming to the Grand, forcing the London Little Theatre to strengthen its community productions. The London-based Don Wright Chorus, which enjoyed great success on Canadian and American airwaves, disbanded in 1956 when network radio collapsed. Movie chains began slashing promotional budgets and closing neighborhood theaters. People go, well, we'll buy a television set, but we'll have to take the money that was spent on the movies to pay off the television set every week, and that's just what happened. Only the people that are selling televisions, they were all right. But in those early years, CFPL engineers weren't really concerned about the consequences of TV. They were too busy learning what to put on air. The 1953 municipal campaign was the first to be televised and the first to see a woman elected to city council. And there's Monsignor, Johnny Metris in front of his Mustang. John Gervin the quarter fakes once, pitches out to Don Getty who sweeps around the right side of his own line and goes for a first down. The non-stop victories of the Western Mustangs kept sports fans riveted to their sets. Under the leadership of Johnny the Bull Metris, the team won nine league championships in a 14-year period. Slippery the Sea Lion's escape from Storybook Gardens and his capture in Ohio made newscasts around the world and brought more crowds to London's newest tourist attraction than the best planned publicity campaign. And if the coverage was stiff and formal, it didn't matter. Any image fascinated viewers. Even local newscasters didn't take themselves too seriously. You find that the downtown core area is difficult to get around in. It's not bad this morning if I hurry. Mm -hmm. I see. Do you find facilities to your liking? Is there enough uh, service around this part of the uh, city? It's good right now if I hurry. Uh -huh. I mean, I can make it at all planned. Did you find that there are enough facilities to suit your business down here? Uh, yeah, it was it great. It was great. It was great. He, he, you, no, here, come back. Like the 1930s, the decade ended with a royal tour. This time, Londoners didn't have to wait on sidewalks to get a close look at Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Television was there to do it for them. I didn't know that uh, protocol prohibited media from, uh, from talking to to the royalty, you know, and, and when, they were talk, when they were busy talking with, with uh, people, you had to stay back. The media had to stay well out of the way. And I asked my assistant to get up there between the wheelchairs and get this microphone in here and pick up some of this casual conversation. I had never seen it before. I'd never heard of it being done before. But I thought, why, why can't we be the first ones? And, and uh, he kept looking at this microphone a couple of times, and then finally he says, if you don't get that microphone out of here, I'm apt to say something very rude. 
The city's attitude towards its British roots would change during the next decade. For the first time in its history, London would escape the shadow of its English namesake and create its own voice in North America. And it all started with a student who had flunked out of the Ontario College of Art. What about this piece with all the nose on it? Were you trying to kid anybody with that? No, I, maybe I was. I, it's hard to say. There it is. What are you going to say about it? Some people will think I was kidding them, some people won't. As it was, I just wrote no on a painting I was doing, and the no speaks, and it comes out and it says it. You can't be more explicit than that. Most of London's establishment didn't understand Greg Kernow's work. Those who did, hated it, including the director of the Public Art Gallery, who was openly horrified with one exhibition. But the younger crowd felt the 25-year-old brought a fresh approach to the art community, and unlike earlier London artists, Kurnow's talent was entirely homegrown. Inspired by the teachers at H.B. Beale's art program, Kurnow decided to work out of his own community. Jack Chambers dropped by, I believe within about the first year of Greg making that decision, and he was just back from Spain, where he had uh, married and done some training, was thinking about going back to Spain, until he dropped by Greg's place and saw this one artist saying, damn it, I'm going to stay here. Uh, there's no way there isn't enough in the, you know, the, the ground from which we take our nourishment, the, the place where we happen to have all these relatives, that you know, this, this place is meaningful for me and I know that if I look deeply enough and hard enough, this will be enough to sustain a career. So the whole explosion of the arts that began in the early 60s, uh, the absolute linchpin in that whole thing was Greg Kernow, but it was Kernow and ultimately about two dozen other people all coming to the same decision. We will go down the 401 to Toronto no more. People said in Toronto, well, gee, you've got Greg Kernow to design one of your shows. He's designed a puppet show for you. Uh, Chambers has designed a, a um, theater and so on and um, for you and all that. We can't get anybody to help us at all down in Toronto. And Keith Turner said, oh, it's it's so blind here, you have to do something. Kerno cultivated everything. Films, plays, art magazines, galleries, and music. He was also determined to promote the work of his fellow artists. He once turned down an offer from the Art Gallery of Ontario to stage his own exhibition, preferring to share the spotlight with his colleagues. Greg wanted to see a scene here. He wanted to see things happen. And he did not want to be the leader of everything. If there was a couple of young artists who might start painting like Greg, he got quite annoyed about that sort of thing because they weren't doing their own thing. They were reading art magazines and, uh, and not working out of their own experience. I just want to keep it the way it is, where my painting is integrated with everything else I do, where I feel genuine about it. As long as I feel the work is genuine, I think that there, there are going to be similarities between paintings. I think the thing about him was that he somehow was completely normal and sweet and communal and friendly and yet still an artist, instead of being bitchy and selfish and mean the way some of them are you know, with a swarm of discarded girlfriends and a couple of suicides, the Andy Warhol thing. That sort of thing just never appealed to Greg. His things were always community, having fun together, and uh, unconsciously being a role model for kids. By the early 1960s, suburbia had arrived. Farmers' fields that had once provided food for the city were now plowed under and paved for housing developments, shopping plazas, and supermarkets. Bellwood Park was among the first new housing developments in post-war London. It soon had company, White Oaks and Glencairn Woods to the south, Westmount and Oak Ridge to the west, Argyle and Nelson Park to the east, Masonville and Stony Brook to the north. The opening of Highway 401 in 1957 began to shift growth away from the city's core. The arrival of super malls accelerated downtown London's decline by creating self-contained commercial communities. City Hall saw the winds of progress and did the inevitable. 
On New Year's Day 1961, London witnessed a mammoth land annexation that took in the university and the village of Byron. The city's population jumped overnight by 50%, while its land area increased from 11 square miles to 62. It was open season for construction.